soldiers coming clean about just how brutal and murderous um, the assault in Gaza was. But the really important thing for us, I think, is not to dwell on those details, important though they are, but is to do two things. One is to explain this conflict properly, and two is to look at solutions. Now, I'm not going to talk for very long, I'm going to try and keep my remarks to 20 minutes, I'm going to try and finish half past five. I'm going to do half of it for explanation and half of it for solution. Um, and it is complicated. Uh, and obviously, you can't do any explanation in 10 minutes. I'm kind of doing outlines. These are themes, I, all, of, all of the themes I touch on here are dealt with in detail in my book. Um, I'm going to kind of focus on two or three specific themes which I regard as the most important in terms of immediate explanation. And the first question in terms of explanation is, why is Israel using such enormous force? It's not the first time. Its existence is punctuated with these examples of overwhelming force. And it's very interesting that the, 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 uh, the um, chair just very kindly mentioned my book, but in my book I mention lots of other books, and one in particular I mention is called The Eye on the Wall. And that's by an Israeli professor called Avi Schlein, who is a very well-known professor at Oxford University, and is a historian of modern Israel. And the phrase that titles his book The Eye on the Wall is a metaphor, is a symbol for overwhelming force. And Schleim argues in his book that not just Israel, but the Zionist militias before Israel, the early part of the 20th century, understood the need to use overwhelming force because that's the only way they could create and embed their settlements. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a particularly unpleasant, and mainly unpleasant, a Zionist ideologue called Jabotinsky, who was actually a real fascist supporter and he uses this phrase, uh, iron wall, and he said, we, unlike many Zionists, used to pretend there was nobody living in Palestine, he knew there was, and there were far more native Palestinians, Palestinian farmers, and there were Jewish settlers coming at the turn of the 20th century. And he said, we have to break the will, the political will, of the Palestinian people if we're going to embed our settlements. So in a way, he understood a truth, and a bitter truth, for the settlements for the settlers, but it wasn't a land without people. There was a people already living there, but the claims that they were making on a Jewish interpretation of the Bible, politically in the modern world, was completely unacceptable to try to claim another person's land. But this went on, and the only way they could do it was by using overwhelming force. This is a terribly important lesson. And Avi Schleim, who's not an extreme radical by any means, although the Zionists try to paint him into a corner and say he is one, says that every generation of Israeli leaders has signed up to the political philosophy of the doctrine of overwhelming force is the only way to break the will of the Palestinian people. It's a terribly important lesson. Now, the Jewish settlers who arrived in Palestine, and they came in very large numbers at the turn of the 20th century, were really fleeing, in many cases, anti-Jewish violence in Eastern Europe. That much of the Zionist story is absolutely accurate. But, of course, going to Palestine wasn't a solution. There were much better solutions. Many Jews stayed to fight. That's terribly important. They fought back against anti-Jewish violence, in many cases very successfully, just before the start of the Russian Revolution, 1905 and 1917. Many more, the vast majority, indeed did migrate. My great-grandparents, and most of the Jewish students in Birmingham University, just like my grandparents or great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents, also came to Britain in that period from Eastern Europe. From about 1870 through to 1910, there was a massive wave of migration, Jewish people fleeing into Jewish violence, mainly going west, not going to Palestine. The problem with a well-intentioned Jewish settler going to Palestine was immediately he or her put foot on the sand and the soil of Palestine is in someone else's territory. You're becoming a colonial settler. Whether that was your intention or whether it wasn't, that's what you became, and that's the problem. And Zionism became an ideology to justify this. And Quite rightly, we talk about Israel today as an apartheid state, but that kind of racism was locked in to the process at the very early stage. In other words, the Jewish state, so-called, had the idea of a Jewish economy much earlier in the 20th century, had the idea of Jews only doing things, an exclusion of the native population. So it's built in to the process, but there's something even more important that we have to understand. That this project to succeed needed a sponsor. And if you look back at the 20th century, it's had two main Western sponsors. For the first half of the 20th century, it was the good old British Empire. For the second half of the 20th century, more or less, 
it was the United States. It could not survive without a sponsor. And they knew it. The founders of Israel, of Zionism, the main founder, Herzl, toured Europe looking for a sponsor. He went to the Tsar of Russia, the very person who was persecuting large numbers of poor Jews, and asked him to be a sponsor on the grounds, you don't like Jews, help us get Jews out of Russia into Palestine. The Tsar said no. They went to the Sultan of Ottoman Empire, which, which occupied Palestine before the First World War. He said no. But the British Empire, as it won in the First World War, said yes, and very cynically. This is a story in itself, and I have a whole chapter on it. It's incredibly fascinating. You may have heard of something called the Balfour Declaration. That's like almost a foundation document of the Jewish homeland of the Jewish state. In 1917, Balfour was a very famous, infamous, imperial, conservative politician, also the architect of the Aliens Act in 1905 to keep Jewish migrants out of Britain, redi redirecting them to Palestine. Why? Because the British Empire wanted Palestine as a colony for itself. For very cynical reasons, for ideological reasons, a kind of cru an old crusade and dream to have this birthplace of Jesus within the British Empire. There's that element too. But even harder economic factors were determining Britain's behaviour at this point. Britain, as Churchill understood, won the war, First World War, on a wave of oil. Getting at that oil was vital to the maintenance of the British Empire. And the oil was coming on stream throughout that part of the world. In fact, you can't really disentangle Israel's development, Israel's role in relationship to Britain and America, and the oil vital to uh, modern world modernity and empire in the 20th century. And that was the connection they made. Churchill said, a Jewish homeland is good for the Jews. Actually, not all Jews ever thought that. Jews, despite what you hear, there's always been a huge division and argument about this whole project, because more internationalist Jews, and there's a great tradition of internationalism amongst Jewish people, understood this was not internationalism. This was a virulent, nasty, narrow nationalism. And we didn't want to go there, lots of Jews said, but many thought otherwise. And some understood it was the only place they could go, and the element of truth as well, as well. So it's complicated. But anyway, this empire connection is fantastically important. Churchill says it's good for the Jews, he says it's good for the British Empire, and he also says it's good for the Arabs. I've never met an Arab, and I've done these meetings for many years. I've never yet met an Arab who thought the British Empire was good for the people of the Middle East, Arab people of the Middle East, but Churchill claimed it was. In any event, the British Empire was bedded down uh, on the back of Palestine, occupying what was Mesopotamia, became Iraq. What else is new? It's extraordinary. A hundred years ago, the British Army was in Iraq. There it is again now. Hopefully it's going to leave very soon. But this is just a, a continuous uh, occupation by Britain and France in particular in the first part of the 20th century. I'm going to fast forward now to the second half of the 20th century. Because the United States takes over Britain's role after the Second World War. And in particular, the United States takes over Britain's role... Um, after 1967. In 1967, Israel was formed in 1948. From the very beginning, it was a fantastically aggressive state. In fact, the root of the problem is at the moment of Israel's foundation. Because when Israel is founded in 1948, the majority of the Palestinians are forced to go, are, 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 are excluded. Nearly a million Palestinian refugees leave their, are forced to leave their towns and villages. They are now five million plus. And it's worth just reminding ourselves that there cannot be a resolution to this conflict until the, 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 the rights of the refugees are properly addressed, including their right to return, if they wish to return. I'll come back to that point in a few minutes. But Israel was founded on the use of massive force. It took part in a number of major regional wars, especially in Suez in 1956, when Egypt's leader Nasser uh, uh, nationalised the Suez Canal. Egypt's leader Nasser became, without doubt, the single most important Arab national leader in the 20th century because of nationalising the Suez Canal. This was this famous archery that um, the Brits cut through that part of North Africa. Uh, well, again, for, for empire reasons, to speed up trade and to bring, eventually bring the oil tankers through there. But in the, it was built by Egyptian labour. It was paid for by British money to begin with. And uh, Egyptian labour and the tolls taken from the canal fed British companies, not Egyptian government coffers. And Nasser was quite right to nationalise it. He called the Fiori, and Egypt uh, came under pressure, was invaded by Britain, France, and Israel, although they didn't succeed in toppling Nasser. Tragically, in 1967, Israel did defeat Nasser, and he, 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 he left. He, he, he um, was effectively, his authority was fundamentally weakened. 
in that war. And from that moment onwards, the United States begins to support Israel with huge sums of money. By the end of the 20th century, Israel had received $100 billion and that made it the highest recipient of United States funding of any of United States client states anywhere in the world. And you ask yourself why? And it's for one very simple reason. Israel began to... The, the toppling, the, 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 the breaking of Arab nationalism in 1967 demonstrated to America that Israel could play the role of a military policeman for its interests. Because Arab nationalism threatened American interests because of the oil, the question of who controls the oil, what's the price of oil going to be, and so on. Those questions needed to be stabilised in terms of what, they, what America's needs were, and they needed, they needed compliant states in the region to um, basically play the game. And in a sense, the, the, the rise of political Islam at the end of the 20th century and now is it replaces Arab nationalism. But the role of the two movements is very similar. Their, their resistance, would be, we, we can discuss the religious factors if we need to, but we need to think of these things politically. Because political Islam, Hamas, Hezbollah, Muslim Brotherhood and so on, replaced secular nationalism as the resistance movement in that part of the world. Why was the resistance movement? Because of the massive pressure of occupation, of manipulation, of interference that the Western powers in Britain, France and now America in particular were imposing on that part of the world. And Israel is the kind of mouthpiece for that. Now, this is fantastically important. I do not want to change gear. This is just an outline in terms of explanation. But that part of the outline is very important because the problem the Palestinians face in terms of solution is they don't just face Israel. They face what I call United States, European Union, Israel. It's a kind of conglomeration of Western power and Israel. And there's no way the Palestinians militarily can defeat that. It's, absolutely, it's clearly impossible. I mean, you saw it in Gaza, um, just, in terms of the, just, in, just, in, just in terms of the weaponry. Hamas had those rockets. Israel had F-116 fighter bombers, helicopter gunships, who now know they have these absolutely terrifying drones, these pilotless uh, machines, which we thought were simply taking photographs. We now know they were dropping bombs with, with formidable accuracy. I mean, it's absolutely terrifying. All that weaponry came from the United States, paid for with American dollars by very often the United States taxpayer. Absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Um, let me take a question at the end, actually. Would so you mind? Just about the drones, um, parts of them are actually made about Miles away in oh well, you've got, you've got your protest. You've just named your next protest. My goodness me. You now have to organise a huge march from the campus to that wretched place. So we can talk about that later. That's very interesting. I never knew that. My goodness. Well, there you are. Um, more about that later, actually. So anyway, so um, that's the problem the Palestinians face. Now, how are they going to resolve this? They cannot resolve it by themselves militarily. Or there's absolutely no question that they will not stop their resistance. Let's look at two ways this can now be resolved. Before we do that, let's just, let's just identify what the three key demands of the Palestinians are. The first demand is end the occupation of the West Bank. Get rid of those horrible settlements, of which there are now nearly half a million settlers in the West Bank. Despite earlier peace agreements, the Israelis went on building settler, settlements and went on, went on expanding existing settlements. You've got to get rid of those settlements. You've got to knock down this horrible apartheid wall. That's the first demand. The second demand is to share Jerusalem, this great city, which is a, which is a very important city. It's an internationally, it's an inter a city of great significance, for obvious reasons, but one very special reason, because three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, have their roots in different ways in that city. It's obvious that city has to be shared, whether people are religious or not. Nearly everybody in that city, in fact, everyone in that city, religious or not, have their roots in one of those three religions, it has to be shared on an equal basis. That shouldn't be open for negotiation. It's absolutely obvious to any kind of civilised person on a humanitarian basis. But Israel claims it as the exclusive Jewish capital of a Jewish state. Clearly that has to go. The third point, the most difficult one I referred to before, is the right of return of the refugees. That is a very, very difficult nut to crack in terms of formal negotiations. Nevertheless, it can be done. I want to explain how. I want to now think about solution in two ways from above and from below. From above, it can be imposed from above, and it could be, and the person to do that is to Barack Obama. Let's talk about Barack Obama for a moment. I said before, United States is a problem, it's the enemy of the Palestinians, because it always sided with Israel. It's like to pose itself as an honest broker. And there's no doubt that Barack Obama genuinely believes he is an honest broker. 
and I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room, I'm sure every person in this room was highly relieved, one, to see the back of George Bush, and two, to see Barack Obama, the first black president. This huge amount of support that he has in America and throughout the world. What a fresh, a, a freshness he brings to that office, no doubt about it. Even, even, even more interesting, you look at the, the base of Barack Obama in America, if you look at all the, on the day of his inauguration, the huge numbers of, especially black people, poor black people on the streets, I thought to myself, if you had a debate amongst all those people on the streets of inauguration day about Israel-Palestine, which side would the supporters be on? I've got no doubt they'd be supporting the Palestinians. Even the citizen voters student movement that campaigned for Obama all those months, when they were asked, are you going to disband your campaign, they said, no, we want to make sure the president keeps his promises. And even amongst those students, traditionally pro-Israel, there's a shift. There's a very famous Jewish anti-Zionist intellectual called Noam Chomsky. He wrote the best book on Israel-America, The Fateful Triangle, another book I strongly recommend. He said for the first time, American students, Jewish students, are changing their mind after Gaza because Gaza has broken the veneer of so-called liberal Zionism. You cannot have a liberal or humanitarian Zionist after Gaza. It's, it's, it's a step too far. So the big shift... So that's the pressure on Obama in a positive direction. Even more important, before Bush left office, remember he was president when, Gaza, when the assault on Gaza was taking place, the White House phone was ringing every day, in one area of the Saudis, in the other area of the Turkish government, both of whom, both of whom, well, actually Turkey's had a peace deal with, with Israel since the 50s, military agreement, tourist agreement, trade agreement. The Turkish Prime Minister was screaming at Bush down the telephone. The Saudi royal family were, they were panicking because their populations are up in arms. They cannot control their populations because what, on their own satellite TV screens, the truth is coming through. So that pressure, the pressure of those populations, especially in the countries which are pro-America, pro privately pro-Israel, is absolutely enormous. So those pressures on Obama are very important. The problem for Obama is the political apparatus that he's trapped in, the old Democratic Party, whose record on this question is absolutely diabolical. And he has put in place all the old Clinton clapped out officials, and they're mainly dreadful on this question. They, they, they play silly games, they're completely dishonest, and they don't deliver. So he's got this problem. So he's caught in this contradiction. And it really depends on which pressure is greatest. But he's coming in, uh, in, 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 at the end of the week, and there's going to be a big demonstration. I hope you're all going to go down to it to greet Obama and the G20 leaders. There'll be huge demonstrations in London. And you can't, obviously, you can't treat Obama like you treat George Bush. Um, you have posts of George Bush, terrorist number one, quite rightly. Clearly, that's not Obama. You have to be much more politically savvy with Obama and then you raise demands. You need to remind Obama what the demands of Palestinians are. But I want to put forward a very, very simple solution. Two, two, two linked solutions. One is, the question of uh, talking to Iran is very important and the panic about Iran's nuclear bomb, maybe. Well, Israel does have nuclear weapons. So the first thing we say to Barack Obama is if you want to get peace with Iran, Tell the Iranians, you're going to insist on weapons inspectors, go into the Negev Desert, where Israel's nuclear weapons are all stockpiled, and you're going, because you're the paymaster, you're going to instruct Israel to dismantle its nuclear weapons. Let's go for a nuclear weapon free Middle East. That's the first thing. The second thing is, we were told before, the war uh, 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 against terror, so-called, was a war for democracy. Okay, it's a war for democracy. That sounds very nice. Let's have a democratic solution for Palestine-Israel. Let's go for those three demands of the Palestinians. Let's go for a major election where all the Israelis vote, one person, one vote, where all the Palestinians vote, one person, one vote, where all the refugees, and you never hear them involved in the peace process, have to be drawn in to the peace process, all the refugees, five million or more, one person, one vote, vote on those three demands. That gives the Palestinians a majority. It's not so unlike what happened when apartheid in South Africa was dismantled from above after pressure from below, they had one person, one vote to bring in Nelson Mandela and black majority rule. I say, let's go for that as a constitutional settlement. Now, will Barack Obama go there? No, he won't. But it's a demand well worth raising because it really does solve the problem. What they are going to go for is some variation of two states. Now, very quickly, the problem with this is that it's been tried before, Israel's always walked away from it, the present government doesn't even want to talk about it, Netanyahu is he's not even for two states, goodness knows what he is for. The problem with two states, it sounds quite fair, but the problem with two states is the refugees. Think about this. It's treating it, you could get a state on the West Bank, you could force the Israelis to share Jerusalem, but if you're going to protect what the Israelis call the Jewish integrity of the Jewish state, you can't let the refugees back because you get a majority of Palestinians inside the Jewish state. Now, I can't say anything wrong with that because I'm an internationalist. 
And actually, I'm also Jewish, and I do remember for centuries, Jews lived side by side with non-Jews, and we developed an internationalism where we demanded, at the time of the French Revolution, equal rights for all ethnic minorities, including Jews. Why you can't use that constitutional settlement of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the constitutional settlement in Britain, with, with parliamentary democracy and so on, to guarantee civil rights, human rights, religious rights, for all ethnic minorities, I do not know whether they're Jewish or Muslim or Christian or however they want to define themselves culturally. So this is a problem. The question of the refugees is a real problem for um, a two-state solution. But I don't rule it out. After Northern Ireland, I mean, who would have believed the political leadership of the IRA could sit in government with the most extreme Protestants? So I, w I don't rule out a, some kind of what I call a halfway house imposed solution. And it's very interesting. I mean, the key here is Hamas. Hamas actually won the election in Palestine in 2006. We got 70% of the vote. This election was then sabotaged both by the CIA in America and by Israel's Mossad. Which you might, we, why you've ended up with this peculiar situation of Hamas in, the West, in, in Gaza and Fatah in the West Bank. It's a completely uh, unacceptable situation. Hamas have to be drawn into the peace process. It's extremely interesting that Hamas's leader in Damascus, Khalid Mishal, has, has, has surprisingly, actually, uh, 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 has, uh, has welcomed the appointment of George Mitchell as Obama's interlocutor in the Middle East. This is the man that helped to bring about the agreement in Northern Ireland. And he's even welcomed Obama's speech the other day. So Hamas are poised to enter the peace process and all sorts of backdoor negotiations are taking place to do that. Whether this, as I say, leads to a genuine halfway house solution, I do not know, but clearly Hamas have to be part of that process. In the end, however, I, I do genuinely think to settle a refugee question, you need uh, 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 one state. Now, very finally, very finally, the, uh, if that doesn't work out, you will see a huge resurgence of the resistance from below. And the way I think that's going to develop is what I call the borderless intifada. We've seen two intifadas, uprisings, by Palestinians. In 1987, the first intifada, and in 2000, the second one, we have Palestinians literally going an uprising. The first time there was non-violence, kids threw stones. There was no weapons. The second time round, there was weapons and bombs. But both times round, this was the mass resistance of all Palestinians. Many taking part, they didn't take part, they certainly supported it. They come up against this blockage because they can't do it by themselves. They're very frustrated by the role of Mubarak's Egypt government on the one hand, and the Jordanian royal family on the other, where the West Bank shares a border with Jordan, where there are 70% Palestinians, by the way, in Jordan, it's highly likely the next uprising in Tafada will spill over those borders and challenge the royal government in Jordan and the Mubarak government in Egypt. And that would bring about a, a most astonishing transformation if you had a kind of uprising right across the region. So I do think that's highly likely. What I will say for absolute certain, I'm going to end on this, is that this is an anti-colonial struggle Anti-colonial struggles in the end are always victorious, however long it takes. If you look back in history, Britain and France occupied most of the world. There were anti-colonial movements on every single continent. In the end, uh, uh, the, the Brits and the French were thrown out. In the sense, Israel represents over old kind of interests. Um, and it's important what we do. What you have all done in these student protests is fantastically important. It's noticed by the Palestinians through the satellite TV. They're astonished that students in Britain are on the march and sitting in for Palestine. It causes fantastic excitement and a real massive boost of support for the Palestinians. They're under siege, as you all know. But when, when you also hear of new opportunities, you can actually march on the place where the drones are at least partly assembled, or whatever component part. That's a fantastic target. I strongly recommend the Palestine Society finds ways of raising this with the other progressive societies and clubs on the campus, and really thinks of targeting uh, that. It's very, all, all of these things, the, um, the, the stopping of Britain supporting Israel economically, especially arms trade, is fantastically important. It's very finally, you know, it's not about Arabs and Jews. There's, 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 um, the, 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 the Labour Party's most senior Jewish former cabinet minister is Sir Gerald Kaufman. He's quite a right-wing former minister. Not only is he Jewish, he's religiously Jewish, and he used to be a Zionist. He's now ferociously not a Zionist. The last time he was in Israel, he said the only place he felt comfortable was in the old mosque in Haifa. He stood up in the House of Commons two or three weeks ago and demanded Brown impose sanctions on Israel. If he can do it, anybody can do it. That's the way forward. That's what solidarity means. Thanks very much.